Hello everyone, welcome to Liam's Lyceum. I'm your host Liam, aka Humbar, and today I'll be talking about another fantasy essay. So this is a series I started a while ago. This is now the fifth episode I am making that I am just going over fantasy essays, discussing them a little bit. They've all been a little different, and this one is, well, no different. And so the first one I went over, though, for those interested, it was um, On Fairy Stories by J.R. Tolkien, From Elfland to Poughkeepsie by Ursula K. Le Guin, um, Magic Sims Aren't, Aren't Magic by D.J. Butler, Epic Poo by Michael Moorcock, and today we're going to go over The Best Introductions to the Mountains by Gene Wolfe. Um, Gene Wolfe is one of my favorite authors, uh, and but compared to a lot of other authors, I haven't actually read a lot by him because he's actually one author I am kind of taking slowly because uh, Gene Wolfe passed a few years ago and I know at some point I will finish all of Gene Wolfe's books and I think I will be very, very sad once that happens. Um, but this article, as it were, is very different from the other ones as it is, uh, it does have some interesting points on fantasy as a whole, um, but it is largely a tribute or even a love letter to Tolkien and I like it just to put it bluntly for that it does have some other things like for example it is very conservative um Dean Wolf was a Catholic it was very conservative um and he relates to Tolkien because of that like um and I don't I've had some people when I shared this little essay with them because a lot of people seem to have not read it um they, they called it disgusting even. Uh, it is very conservative though, and I think that Gene Wolfe is generally a pretty good guy though, so right, like, um, I think attacking him, even though he's dead, uh, is a little silly, whether you disagree with the stuff that's in here or not, um, but it definitely gives off some conservative stuff, which we'll talk about here in a minute. Uh, but the name itself I wanna talk about real quick is, it com comes from a Tolkien story actually, um, Leaf by Niggle, which I recently read, it actually go, ties in pretty well with On Fairy Stories by J.R.R. Tolkien. Um, and I'm just going to read this one paragraph for you real quick. This is from the very, very end of the story. It is proving very useful indeed, said the second voice, as a holiday and a refreshment. It is splendid for convalesc convalescence. And not only for that, for many it is the best introduction to the mountains. It works wonders in some cases. I am sending more and more there. They seldom have to come back. Um... And that, I mean, I'm reading that from uh, Tales from the Perilous Realm. Um, but it's it's cool that he pulled that title um, from that story, not just a story by Tolkien, um, right? Because that is about, like, creating, about art. Um, and uh, it's pretty interesting. The essay itself was actually written to be included in an anthology called uh, Meditations on Middle-Earth, edited by Karen Haber or Haber, um, it was actually rejected, so it doesn't appear in that um, uh, anthology. It was published on in Interzone magazine on December 2001. It's on a website as well, which it did have permission to publish on this website for Mr. Wolf passed a few years ago. Um, that's actually where I read it. I will share that website in the link. Um, Chris Ferracchio actually sent this, um, like, introduced me um, to this um, essay. Of sorts um, but basically let's just get right to it anyway so he, he goes on kind of starting with the um, Christianized medieval barbarians being largely good because they understood their role um, and so good to the point where these barbarians um, no they weren't really Christian at the time but the idea of the north basically right um, could even be like the Romans and he says the Greeks too um, there's something there, I guess. Uh, it's it's pretty interesting. I think that a lot of people have a tendency when it becomes when when you get these conservative things um, that a lot of people have a tendency to call people Nazis. It's kind of an aside. Um, Nazis did like a lot of stuff like that too, uh, but lumping them all together is a little weird. And I think Wolf actually uh, uh, touches on that too. Um, but he basically is talking about it because Tolkien gets to this ideal basically through history and philology. Um, and this ideal comes from what he liked to study, um, so like Old English literature and other things of that sort, right? The Northern stuff, Germanic stuff, um, which, you know, just like anyone, for, you know, lots of people like their own history 
it makes sense for other people to like their own history. I don't think they should be called Nazis for doing that anyways, regardless if they're conservative or not. Um, but he says that Tolkien um, resonated with him um, because, quote, as a child, I had been taught a code of conduct. I was to be courteous and considerate, and most courteous and most considerate of, um, of those less strong than I, of girls and women, and of old people especially. Thus educated men might hold inferior positions, but that did not mean that they themselves were inferior. They might be, and often would be, wiser, braver, and more honest than I was. They were entitled to respect and were to be thanked when they befriended me, even in minor matters. Legit legitimate authority was to be obeyed without shirking and without question. Me um, mere strength, the corrupt coercion Washington calls power in Chicago clout, was to be defied. It might be better to, um, to be a slave than to die, but it was better to die than to be a slave who acquiesced in his own slavery. Above all, I was to be honest with everyone. Debts were to be paid, and my word was to be as good as I could make it. Um, it seems very old-fashioned. Uh, I mean, I think a lot of people would agree with most of that still. Um, I think some people would get offended by a lot of that stuff, but I, I think even then, um, it's it still stands rather largely. Um, and so it, it's pretty interesting again, but you can definitely see his conservatives coming through. Um, he, he contrasts that the opposite of this is Mordor, basically, right? Um, <laughs> which is pretty funny. Um, but then uh, he also talks about how he became familiar with the Lord of the Rings. He, he read a review in a magazine, actually, once he could apparently have started forwarding in those magazines. He talks about, um, the again, the lack of big bookstores to go and buy science fiction, uh, fantasy, horror, so speculative fiction, really. Um, because even if there was book, a book eh, a bookstore, they wouldn't have that stuff generally, or there'd be very few um, options in that category. This is the mid 1950s, which means he actually was reading the Lord of the Rings before it boomed in the 60s. Um, but uh, let's see. And then he, interestingly enough, he has all these books as he's writing it with him, and he's looking at the poems he inscribed in each version. So, for example, in Fellowship of the Ring, he inscribes a poem by Thoreau, and in the Two Towers, he inscribes a poem by Aiken. And lastly, in The Return of the King, he has one by Robert E. Howard, which he says is his favorite and actually one, probably one of the best things ever written. Um, I've actually shared the poem by Thoreau and the one by Howard on my channel for Poetry Thursday, actually, too. Um, and then he also shares a letter that he got in response to, um, from, you know, he wrote a letter to Tolkien and Tolkien responded, um, which was really cool. Its contents are basically that uh, uh, about the the origins or the etymology really behind orcs and wargs, um, <clears throat> which is again kind of cool. And then he starts to close his tribute and get into a little bit more th other things. He says, I have shown you, I hope, what these books have meant to me. If you find echoes of them in my own books and stories, and particularly in The Wizard Knight, with which I have struggled for the past year, you will not have dis discomforted me. Confided me? I don't know what he says. Anyways, I am proud of them. Um, Terry Brooks has often been disparaged for imitating Tolkien, particularly by those reviewers who find his books inferior to Tolkien's own. I can only say that I wish there were many, or there were more imitators. We need them, and that all imitations of so great and original must necessarily be inferior. I think that was one of the most interesting things I ever read when I first read this essay um, earlier this year. Uh, I think it was earlier this year, and uh, just because I see Terry Brooks does get a lot of hate, the sort of the sort of scenario was a book I didn't actually I didn't finish it because of its similarities to Tolkien. But you know, he's basically you know. Um, putting Tolkien way up there, you know, he's basically saying, if you're going to imitate Tolkien, well, he deserves to be imitated, um, which is pretty interesting, you know, like, he's basically saying, make as much fantasy as Tolkien-esque as possible, and I'll, uh, I'm here for it, basically. Um, he doesn't write a lot of stuff like that, I feel like. Uh, I haven't, I've yet to read The Wizard Knight. Um, maybe it's more Tolkien-esque. I know it is more, well, definitely different, but I thought it was more, like, Arthurian or something, but and then he also talks about, like, at one point he says is um, progress and change are not synonymous. Um, he talks about entropy here. Um, again, connecting it kind of like Tolkien finds this ideal with history and philology. He finds the same ideal with um, uh, with uh, science because he's more of the scientific stuff. Um, and, uh, yeah, anyway, so... 
And then he's basically saying that in this millennium, because he wrote this in the early odds, I believe, uh, we will find that ideal essentially, and that we need to think Tolkien for it because he reminded us of this ideal that came about from basically um, medieval period before a thousand um, AD. Uh, and so he's saying like freedom, love of neighbor and personal responsibility are s steep slopes. He could not climb them for us. I mean, we must do that ourselves. But he has shown us the road and the reward. Uh, that is the closing remarks um, talking about uh, Tolkien and Lord of the Rings specifically. And uh, I think it's very sweet. I think it's uh, very cool to see um, his thoughts, you know, very personal, you know, like it's not like he's coming out really to educate anyone. It's so it's very different in that sense. Um, it's just his his own thoughts on Tolkien. And you can definitely see some things that, as far as I'm aware, didn't come out a lot in his other things, um, uh, like his conservatism and, you know, like stuff like that. So, um, Wolf seems like a pretty nice guy. I know some people don't like this essay, but I know a lot of people really do. Um, if you're a fan of Wolf, you might like the essay. Um, if you're Catholic, you probably will. <laughs> um, I'm not Catholic. Um, but, uh, I think it's a pretty interesting essay. I think it's one that if you are a fan of Tolkien, I would go and read just to see maybe if you can get an idea, maybe agree with Wolf on some things, disagree with him on other things. Um, as someone who studies similar things to what Tolkien studied, um, it's definitely an interesting thing to think about. And I'm not sure I can totally give you a solid answer on me agreeing with Wolf. I mean, considering also Wolf is saying Tolkien thought this and, I, and in some ways, I don't think he's off the mark with what he thinks Tolkien thought. Um, I'm not 100% sure I agree with everything he says. But that being said, it is very thoughtful. And I think I am wanting to agree, uh, if that makes sense. Uh, but again, I'd have to think about it more. It's definitely interesting to go back and read it again, even though it hadn't been that long. It's not a very long essay either. So, um, But again, so Love Letter to Tolkien by one of speculative fiction's greatest authors of all time, uh, Gene Wolfe, uh, again, about one of the other greatest of all time, Tolkien. So, from Leo Leems Lyceum, I'll catch you next time.